Yeah, so I, I, I'd like to thank our Red Bull team. Uh, you know, I believe in talent, tenacity, and teamwork. And as you can see from Rob, he's got energy to spare and to burn. Uh, so I just wanted to point out our Division of Regenerative Medicine here. I see Jeremy Rich at the back. Uh, so we have a small cadre of faculty. He's trying to hide. Uh, Rob Signer, Dan Kaufman, uh, Leslie Cruz has got to be somewhere, uh, Tiffany Tanaka. We've got our Alpha Clinic team with our fearless leader over there, Betty Cabrera. Uh, we have Kimmy Denoble. We have Jennifer Braswell as our executive director of the Stanford Stem Cell Clinical Center. It's a stellar team, and we need a lot. Uh, I need a lot of caffeine. They don't. Uh, anyway, so I wanted to talk about detection and targeting of malig malignant progenitor reprogramming and. Uh, just preface this by saying the reason we can take risks in research is because we live in this unique environment that Ida DeChaita keeps telling me is really the vital essence for how we translate discoveries. We have this dynamic relationship with industry here. It's not us versus them. It's us. It's our collective responsibility to improve outcomes for our patients who have cancer or will have cancer. And I was, I've mentioned quite a few times we're all going to be patients. Unfortunately, we can't get away from that. Uh, so really, this is not an altruistic effort. So a number of years ago, Derek Rossi, Irv Weissman, and I wrote a review on stem cells and the pathways to aging and cancer to say how much of this change in uh, the clock-like signature, as Ludmill was aptly pointing out, occurs just as a natural consequence of aging. And how much do these mutations accumulate at the level of the hematopoietic stem cell to contribute to a progenitor population that then gains this malignant capacity to self-renew, or in other words, clone itself? So we thought that was important at the time, and of course a lot has been done in this field to really extend this beyond leukemia to suggest that maybe this process of clonal hematopoiesis, where we develop mutations at the level of our blood-forming stem cells, actually also matters for solid tumors. So there was a paper recently by Ross Levine that I wrote the perspective for in Nature, and I'd called it a tout brute, when your best friend turns against you and nature said, no, nobody's read Julius Caesar, they won't know what that is. <laughs> I said, okay. So they called it bad blood promotes tumor progression, which I thought was pretty funny because they clearly like Taylor Swift. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, uh, this, they uh, suggested in their really nice paper that we develop mutations at the level of the stem cell, and Ludmilla has made a tremendous contribution to this field in terms of defining our lifestyle factors that may increase uh, this chance of getting these mutations. And then we get clonal hematopoiesis, where these clonally mutated stem cells give, la give rise to a preleukemic progenitor population. Now, what's so bad about this preleukemic progenitor population is it actually instructs solid tumor cells to proliferate, and those become inherently therapeutically resistant. So clonal hematopoiesis, our blood also matters for other tissues. You can't extract a pound of flesh, as Portia said so aptly in The Merchant of Venice, without taking blood. So this is um, what we've been trying to target, these mutated stem cells together with Charlie McDermott in the back of the room and uh, John Hood. Uh, we started a company called Impact, and uh, so I'm a co-founder, so conflicted there, so I have to mention that. But there was a drug uh, that we'd worked together on for a number of years, uh, John Hood and I, and with David Cherish co-founding a local company called Targogen. There was a selective JAK2 inhibitor. We were trying to target mutated uh, stem cells in myeloproliferative neoplasms where you make too many of one type of cell in the bone marrow. We were able to go all the way from phase one to phase three trials, and then everything stopped because it looked like there was a strange side effect that unfortunately was not investigated uh, very thoroughly despite the absolute efficacy of this drug. Uh, so we um, recently reinvestigated the efficacy, and this has been acquired by a company called Celgene and uh, will be developed further for this indication. So we, we see disease modification when we target the stem cells. We go from scarring of the bone marrow to this uh, transient aplastic phase to normal hematopoiesis. Um, with Tanisha Rea, we worked on another pathway that's hijacked by progenitors in cancer, and that's the hedgehog signaling pathway. And we're able to work with a local company, Pfizer, uh, again with Ida's help and CIRM funding, which we were very grateful for, to develop this drug that had been on the shelf at Pfizer because it didn't work in their pancreatic cancer models. We said, can we use that to target leukemia stem cells? And what surprised us is the people 
that had the worst disease, the highest GLEE2 expression, which is a downstream transcriptional activator of the hedgehog pathway, actually did the worst, or the best. Uh, so the, you see the average age here is 59. Uh, so there were some hopeful people that said, okay, I'll take a pill to inhibit hedgehog, and the best responders were the ones with AML and they had the highest glee expression. So this went on to phase two and now phase three studies. It's increased survival in AML when combined uh, with an epigenetic modifier, and so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, finally, there was another stem cell targeting agent that we wanted to develop, and that was an antibody that would target ROR1, which is an embryonic antigen that's re-expressed, uh, but a, a number of invasive and metastatic malignancies, uh, most of all chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And so over a four-year period with CIRM funding, we didn't want them to take away our funding, so we called it CIRM Tuzumab. Uh, anyway, uh, we did manage to make this antibody. The team was led by Tom Kipps, and uh, Michael Choi and I have uh, done this trial with a lot of help from Riley Kidwell, who's been our fantastic clinical trials coordinator. The weird thing here is because it hadn't ever been tested in humans, we had to start at a very low dose. And so we had a number of cohorts. We finished this trial at the end of last year, and we're just submitting the paper, Sheila. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so there were no dose-limiting toxicities. Uh, the issue is cancer is more clever than that. You can't just get at cancer with a single targeted agent, whether it be a small molecule, biologic, or maybe even a cellular therapy. So what we really need to do, and this is Tom with the vial from the first patient, it was a pretty happy day, September 2014, is we need to target these dormant stem cells in the malignant microenvironment that seem to be very good at evading chemotherapy and radiation uh, because they're not dividing. A lot of our agents target dividing cells, and this is what Jane was so eloquently talking about in her uh, seminal um, presentation earlier. So basically, these dormant stem cells are in the crosshairs for us. And the real question was, how do you get at these cells uh, that tend to be asleep um, and be able to evade the chemo or radiation therapies that we have. So basically, these cells are in G0 or G1. Uh, we worked with Roger Chen's uh, previous postdoc at Sushi Miyawaki to refine the FUCHI system, as it's called, the fluorescence ubiquitination cell cycle indicator. And what uh, Gabriel Pineda and uh, Katie Lennon did in the lab is they made this a single lentiviral vector. And so what this allows us to do is track the populations of cells based on their cell cycle status and be able to sort out single cells that are alive and interrogate their proteomics, their transcriptomics, their DNA uh, mutational signature. When we compare 293 cells that transit within a 24-hour period pretty regularly to normal cells, you'll see that the normal progenitors uh, actually move around a little bit more than their malignant progenitor counterparts. They just really want to stay in this G0, G1 quiescent phase and adhere to the malignant microenvironment. So it's these cells that are in the crosshairs, these are the cells that are going to need combination therapy to be eradicated. So we wanted to see, we've heard a lot about DNA repair and DNA mutations. What's happening at the level of RNA? So if you think about the DNA as the architect's blueprints for your house, the RNA as the engineer's interpretation, the protein's the builder, we've worked on how engineering went awry in cancer and what happens with aging. So we started to look into RNA splicing during aging, and uh, we're looking at the hematopoietic stem cell population compared uh, with more committed progenitors. And what you see with young versus aged stem cells is they're really different at the level of splicing. So that means we can look at your age based on your splicing pattern in your stem cells. So our stem cells give us away. We can't hide that. Uh, the progenitors, on the other hand, really look quite different. So there's a lot more variability between individuals at the level of the more committed daughter cells of the stem cells called progenitors. So this 82-year-old woman here looks like a 30-year-old uh, at the progenitor level from an RNA splicing standpoint. And that may have to do with the progenitors um, really being the cells that give rise to our immune cells and respond to pathogens. So not a lot of overlap between uh, the splicing signatures between stem and aged uh, progenitors. But when you look at aged, young and aged stem and progenitor cells compared to 
high-risk myelodysplastic syndrome and AML, you'll see they're completely different. So something's happening as people transition to AML. And what we're seeing more of in terms of problems with splicing uh, during leukemic transformation is exon skipping and intron retention. And that leads to certain isoforms that are overexpressed, CD44, which enhances cell adhesion, P2K2B, an isoform that enhances survival. So what we've been able to do, and this is a plug for Sheila for Cell Stem Cell, uh, we've got the senior editor in the audience here, um, is to really try and work to revert uh, this malignant signature back to a normal aged splicing pattern. We just got um, CIRM funding to develop a targeted splicing modulator. Um, so that's how we're proceeding with acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, in terms of a more indolent disease, chronic myeloid leukemia, we've worked on this for a number of years to understand the clonal evolution of CML at the stem and progenitor level. So we discovered, as Rob was alluding to in 2004, that it was really the granulocyte macrophage progenitors that gained the capacity to self-renew, or in other words, clone themselves, as a result of acquisition of beta-catenin at the wrong stage of hematopoietic differentiation. So beta-catenin is a stem cell self-renewal agonist. It's here in red. It shouldn't be on in the progenitor population. And because it gets turned on in the progenitors, the progenitors lack the intrinsic capacity to turn it off because the stem cell population is normally the one that would express that. So that malignant progenitor reprogramming is something that vexed us for a while. You know, we discovered this in 2004. It was a, a heretical discovery because people said a progenitor can't behave like a stem cell, and we said, ah, it can. It's a caricature of a stem cell. It just lacks the capacity to turn self renewal off. So we started asking, why does this happen? Uh, did an extensive mutational uh, sequencing approach found that it was just one change, and that was GSK3 beta misplicing. So GSK3 beta is a negative regulator of beta catenin, and it appeared to be misplaced in the progenitor population. So we started to ask, why does that happen? And there was somebody in the lab at the time, Jen Black, who said, well, maybe it's this gene called ADAR1 that can introduce new splice acceptor sites. And I said, well, I've never heard of that. What is ADAR? Uh, and she was interested in, in ADAR because she was trying to expand uh, stem cell populations uh, from human embryonic stem cells and had read papers by Stu Orkin and others that suggested that ADAR is absolutely vital for maintaining uh, hematopoietic stem cells. So in humans, we have three ADARs. ADAR stands for adenosine deaminase associated with RNA1. And basically, ADAR1 is the primary RNA editase, so it edits adenosine to in a scene and therefore changes the transcriptome. ADAR2 edits primarily in other tissues, uh, usually in coding sequences. ADAR3 lacks editing capacity and may actually behave like an inhibitor for ADAR2. So this adenosine to inosine change can introduce new splice acceptor sites, it can change the coding sequence, and it can actually change RNA topology. Uh, these ADARs act in double-stranded RNA loops. Those are the sequences they like. Uh, they're primarily editing, at least for ADAR1, in the context of primate-specific ALU sequences. So if, like me, in undergrad, you learn there's junk DNA and it's there for no reason, I think uh, that instruction was probably wrong. 10% of our genome is comprised of ALU sequences. These sequences are not junk. They don't exist in mice. They're only in primates, and they have an essential function in terms of dictating when and where ADARs decide to edit. Now, why do ADARs matter? They're an essential component of our innate antiviral immune response. So they're really there to be sushi chefs for retroviral vectors like HIV or retroviral pathogens, and they're elicited in response to interferon gamma and other cytokines. Now, you know, ADAR was not a particularly interesting topic until very recently. Um, so recently there was a group at MIT that showed, and also at Stanford with Jin Billy Lee really leading the charge here, that showed the dynamic landscape and regulation of RNA editing in mammals is completely divergent. So if you look at RNA editing that's driven by ADAR, it's completely different in humans and mice, again, because we have these ALU sequences. So you really can't study editing capacity appropriately in mice if you want to make uh, um, any kind of 
um, conclusions about human biology. Now, what made it so interesting last year, so ADAR was considered to be uh, the number two discovery in Science Magazine last year, was because of this group at MIT that suggested that ADAR could be used for RNA repair in post-mitotic cells when coupled with CRISPR. Uh, Cas13. So this is a way to repair RNA and could be extremely useful. Um, the only downside is if you don't target ADAR's activity properly, it could introduce really malignant edits, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so we've worked on RNA editing, so this is the emerging field of the epitranscriptome. So what this refers to is post-transcriptional modification of RNA. You can methylate RNA, so this N6-methyladenosine helps to determine stem cell fate. Uh, you can edit RNA with ADAR. Uh, microRNAs are susceptible to editing, but so are 3' UTRs, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, you can introduce new splice acceptor sites. We'll hear more this afternoon from Jonathan Licht about uh, DNA modifications and uh, epigenetic uh, changes from Yanis Ivantis as well. Uh, so a few years ago, we discovered that ADAR was upregulated in chronic myeloid leukemia as it progressed to blast crisis, and this was in the setting of high expression of interferon gamma, which is uh, the main uh, solicitor of ADAR signaling. It really tells ADAR, come on over and start editing. So this coincided with upregulation of BCR ABL, which is the driver gene for chronic myeloid leukemia initiation. Uh, so we started asking, what is ADAR doing there? And it's, this is the isoform that's activated by interferon gamma and other inflammatory cytokines. Uh, so what Maria, Mariana Zepeto and others in the lab found was ADAR was actually editing a primary microRNA called LET7. And the reason that's important is usually LET7 is there to induce differentiation, and it couldn't introduce uh, that differentiation effect because it was edited um, and couldn't be matured. When we introduced that edited site by site-directed mutagenesis at the Drosia cleavage site or the Dicer cleavage site, it was really the Drosia cleavage edit that prevented maturation of LET7. And we know that ADAR binds to LET7 by CLIP, uh, cross-linking immunoprecipitation. What happened when LET7 couldn't mature is we saw upregulation of LET7 targets, including WINT9A, which is a canonical WINT. So as I mentioned before, these progenitors really activate WINT beta catenin signaling. So we think part of the reason for that is ADAR editing. Uh, so what do you do about it? Um, so what we thought, well, interferon gamma receptor signals through JAK2, IL-3 receptor alpha, which is also expressed by the leukemia stem cells in CML, uh, goes through JAK2 as well. And so by using a JAK2 inhibitor, we can dial down ADAR transcriptional activity. And in CML, we also use a bcr able inhibitor, getting back to the point that we're going to need at least dual um, targeting of the leukemia stem cell. So getting back to Rob's point in the very beginning of the day, how do we understand uh, malignant hematopoiesis? We always have to do it in the context of normal hematopoiesis. To understand malignancy, we have to understand normal development, as Jane pointed out so adequately and eloquently. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, we started looking at what does ADAR do when overexpressed, and it's the editase-competent ADAR compared to the mutant that can't edit. Well, the editase-competent ADAR seems to change cell cycle gene regulation. And when overexpressed, actually, um, and it's a microRNA that's normally a regulator of cell cycle progression called MIR26A, as we see here. So if we introduce that edit, we prevent maturation of MIR26A, and cells start proliferating. And that's in the normal setting. But in the malignant setting, what we find is um, not only does ADAR edit the component of microRNAs, it actually edits where microRNAs would bind. And so um, it edits the MDM2 uh, site for binding its uh, negative regulatory microRNA, MIR-155. So MIR-155 is downregulated by editing, and you have MDM2 3' UTR editing that prevents binding. So you have an accumulation of MDM2, and that represses P53. So this MDM2 editing may be important for other tumor types. Uh, we're really starting to look at a number of other malignancies uh, that may have downregulation of P53 as a result of that. 
we are looking at myeloma. Uh, this is work done primarily by Elisa Lazari and Leslie Cruz in the lab. And the reason we started to look at myeloma is because Leslie looked at the COMPASS data set, and this is the importance of publicly available data. The COMPASS data set was from patients with multiple myeloma, and basically what that showed us is in myeloma, in about a third of cases, you have copy number amplification of ADAR at the locus. And that tends to be amplified right next to IL-6 receptor. So we see increased ADAR expression, even in some newly diagnosed high-risk patients, uh, but it really is a marker of progression in myeloma. And um, what happens there is ADAR overexpression in myeloma is a negative prognostic factor. What does ADAR do in myeloma? Well, we found something very interesting that was sort of unexpected. It seems to edit GLI. Now, I mentioned GLI is a downstream transcriptional activator of the hedgehog pathway, and what ADAR does in myeloma is it edits GLI-1 at the SUFU binding site, so it can no longer bind its negative regulator, and so it hangs on as this uh, really highly active transcriptional activator, the Red Bull transcriptional activator. Uh, so that edited GLI-1 has hyper-hedgehog signaling pathway activity. And the way we show that is if we knock down ADAR1, we decrease the GLI editing. And uh, we can show that GLI editing is really important because it activates this GLI reporter uh, very effectively. So does this matter? I mean, that's kind of a cool result, but does it have any consequence uh, in vivo? So Lisa Lazari spent a couple of years making a humanized mouse model of myeloma. This is high-risk myeloma uh, that um, was developed in concert with Mark Minden, uh, who's our collaborator in Toronto. And we tagged these cells using uh, luciferase, using a lentiviral vector. We're able to follow progression of myeloma in these mice. This is human myeloma, so we can track the cap or light chain by ELISA, but also the populations that are arising in these mice by flow cytometry. So what we found in these mice is that we got engraftment of myeloma in a serial transplantation setting. So this is the first serially transplantable model of multiple myeloma. So we had engraftment in the bone marrow, the spleen, peripheral blood, liver, and then we got these solid tumor plasma cytomas or solid tumor collections of myeloma. And what we see here is that we get persistent um, development of that monoclonal protein that's really typical for myeloma. We are able to serially transplant the disease. And then what we see is after ADAR silencing, we're able to reduce engraftment in the serial transplant setting and able to reduce human engraftment as uh, judged by ALU and also decrease ADAR if we knock down ADAR. So the bottom line is, in a third of patients with myeloma, they amplify ADAR1 at the locus, 1Q21, which happens to sit right next to IL-6 receptor, so they really amplified ADAR expression. And then as the disease progresses, they get more IL-6 in the microenvironment and also become resistant to these immunomodulatory drugs like lenalidomide. Uh, so this increased ADI editing really needs to be targeted very specifically, and that's what Leslie Cruz is going to go on and do in her own lab. So I've talked a lot about uh, lymphoid malignancies, myeloid malignancies, all blood cancers. Does this really matter for other cancers? So usually if you think you're working on something really cool, somebody else is working on it too. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened to us. So we thought we were working in the hinterlands of science. Nobody else is going to have thought of this. This is so arcane, so different, so weird. Nobody would think of this. Well, actually, uh, Han Liang and Gordon Mills were th not only thinking about it, uh, they were screening 6,500 tumors by RNA sequencing in 17 different tumor types, and they found uh, that a large proportion of those tumors, as they decided to invade and metastasize and become resistant to chemotherapy, upregulated adenosine to inosine RNA editing driven entirely by ADAR1. 6,500 tumor types. So we said, okay, we're not the only ones thinking about this. Uh, so we and others are trying to develop ADAR selective inhibitors. Uh, Gabriel Pineda 
Eduardo Reynoso and a rapidly expanding team in the lab are really trying to purify ADAR1 to homogeneity. As you know, Peter Beal purified ADAR2. It was a very nice science paper. But ADAR1 is really quite different. Uh, the catalytic domain uh, that was used by the group at MIT for RNA repair is something that we're working with to purify to homogeneity. And uh, these are data that are hot off the press. Uh, Gabriel and Eddie managed to do this together with the team in the lab uh, just in the last week uh, by doing codon um, optimization in Saccharomyces and then this GST tag. And of course, they said it'll never work. And it worked beautifully. <laughs> So we've got milligram quantities of this protein, and we're going to use it for X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM uh, to see if we can find direct binders. Uh, they're also working hard on making the full length, and then we've got the mutant version of the protein as a control. Uh, in the final uh, couple of minutes, I just wanted to mention what Ludmill was alluding to is that there are some very specific DNA mutations uh, that occur and are likely to be induced by Apobex that Ruben Harris first cloned a number of years ago, and he's in the back. Hello, Ruben. Uh, anyway, so Ruben did this brilliant work on these DNA mutators uh, that uh, deaminate C's to T's, and they seem to be also, of course, very important in cancer, as um, identified by Ruben and also by um, Ludmill and Mike Stratton. So these mutational signatures are enzymatic. They're induced by these apobex. They're extremely important. As, and as you can see, a number of groups have shown that if you look at this uh, apobex signature, it's really prevalent in a large proportion of cancers that like to invade and metastasize. So what we found that was kind of interesting, when we overexpress ADAR, uh, we start to see changes in apobec expression. So that kind of surprised us. And actually, we're seeing very specific editing of apobec. So these are the DNA mutators that are being mutated by the RNA mutators. So it's sort of backwards. So we're trying to understand what this means functionally. Uh, Jane Isquith in the lab, together with Fei Jiang and others, have actually cloned uh, the majority of the apobex and uh, are looking to see what kind of mutational signatures do they introduce in fully normal stem of progenitor cells compared to pre-malignant and malignant cells. So in essence, what we're really trying to understand is this evil twin hypothesis that Rob Signer brought up this morning. How much of what happens is just healthy human aging, and it's what we can expect. Uh, we can't prevent it, nor do we want to, because healthy human aging prevents these malignant progenitors from surviving, as opposed to malignant human aging, where you get this RNA editing in the progenitor population that then allows these progenitors to self-renew and survive. Uh, so that's what we're working on pretty hard in collaboration with Ludmill and others in the room. Um, sometimes you have to ride a bike to raise money to do this. Uh, so Bill Komen has really inspired us to um, get on bikes and see what we can do to raise uh, money for cancer research. We've been very fortunate with our funding, uh, really with uh, a lot of support from CIRM. Thank you, Maria. Uh, so we're very pleased to be able to continue to work with CIRM, the NCI, NHLBI, and very thoughtful philanthropic groups and collaborators. So thank you. Time for a couple questions. Uh, I'll, I'll do the first one again. Yeah. Um, when you see the the defects in splicing and the mm -hmm. intron retention, yeah. what, what happens to those RNAs? Are they actually translated? And are you getting like translation of peptides from introns that normally shouldn't be there? Mm -hmm. um, and if you do, are, are they immunogenic because they're you know, not supposed to be there and, and may look foreign? Three great questions, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so when we first found the GSK3 beta misplice, we were tortured because we didn't expect it. Uh, that, in, that one in particular is translated. It forms a protein with a different PI, so isoelectric focusing point. We had to buy a nanoproteomics device to prove that because we were looking at a minority population of progenitors that expressed it. Uh, so um, the question about whether or not it could be immunogenic was something that was um, investigated by collaborators at Harvard, and uh, it looked like the GSK3 beta misplice would form a neoantigen, uh, but we didn't really pursue that to look at antigenicity. I think it's an excellent point, though, because when you get this exon skipping or intron retention and splice isoforms that are more common with aging and in cancer, 
they could form neoapitopes. So I think that um, we really need to start sequencing not just at the DNA level but also at the RNA level to see how many of these um, transcripts become proteins that are then degraded to peptides that can be expressed and form neoantigens in cancer. So Raphael Behar in our group and Tiffany Tanaka treated their first patient this week uh, with neoepitope targeting using an, an adoptive T-cell approach for MDS. So I think that's exactly where we need to go with this. Uh, as for other um, products of exon skipping and intron retention, we haven't done enough at the level of the proteome to really know, are they stabilized? That's where we want to collaborate with you. Uh, do they form neoantigens? I think it's a great question, a great three questions. Thanks, Andy. Hi, Katrina. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. Um, do you know anything about ADAR upregulation in proliferating non-malignant uh, cells that are associated with cancer? So. Um, where I'm going with this is, so Jeff Wall's mm -hmm. group and I did a study in pancreas cancer looking at the cancer-associated fibroblast population and showed that P53 function is markedly depressed in those cells despite the fact that P53 is wild type. So right. you're finding about MDM2. That was for you. Me. So, yeah, yeah. So, so I was wondering if, if, if anything's known about that uh, as a mechanism for getting cancer-associated cells in the right. microenvironment to proliferate? It's such a great question, and uh, this is, I think, something that was asked of Jane as well. Um, this is Larissa Belaine's specialty. She's sitting just two rows in front of you here. Larissa's always been telling us the microenvironment instructs these cells as much as the malignant stem cells instruct the microenvironment. So it's definitely a two-way street. Uh, so we've done analysis on the stroma and bone marrow. Of course, we haven't looked and would love to look with you in pancreas cancer and the surrounding uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts, but at least in the bone marrow stroma, we are seeing higher levels of editing, RNA editing. But in that case, it doesn't seem to be driven by ADAR1. It looks like it may be more ADAR2 dependent. So that was very interesting. So we're looking into that. Uh, we have our entire editome analysis on both the malignant stem cells as well as the uh, stromal population. And it's just a gamish. You know, we didn't... Uh, flow sort any progenitor population out of the stoma, but I think your point's very well taken. It's the crosstalk there. So I did want to mention we do have cancellation of a speaker in the next session, Gay Crooks, uh, due to a family emergency. So um, we will have a little bit more time for the break. I'll be happy to answer any more questions. Anything else? No? Okay. Thanks very much.